Hello, my name is Shahriar Shahriari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on undergraduate abstract algebra based on my book, Algebra in Action, a course in groups, rings, and fields. This particular lecture is about definitions and basic properties of rings, integral domains, and fields. And it's based on sections 15.2 and 15.3 of my book. So let's get started by defining what rings are. So a ring is a set with two operations, with addition and multiplication. We don't know what the elements of the set are, but we do know that there are two operations. And by operations, we mean we can take two elements and do the operation and get a third element from the set. And we're calling those operations plus and times. Um, and uh, we write this as R plus and times. The R is the set, the set of elements, and the plus and times are going to be um, the operations. If the operations have other names, then we would put those instead of the plus and times. Um, we want these operations to satisfy certain basic properties. So we want with addition to have an abelian group. And what does that mean? Well, that means that we want to have closure. Well, that's a part of saying that we have an operation. If A and B are in our set, A plus B, whatever that is, got to be in our set as well. We need associativity. A plus B plus C should be the same as A plus B plus C. Um, and, and we should be able to put the parentheses for associativity. We need to have an additive identity that we call zero. So we have this one element, this special element zero, that when you add it to other things, nothing happens. Zero plus A should be A, as should be A plus zero. We need additive inverses. So for every element in our set, we have to have a friend minus A, that if we add it to that, we get that zero that we had. And finally, because it's an abelian group, it, we need commutativity. So we need A plus B to be the same as B plus A, regardless of A and B in, um, in our set. So addition should give us a group. We should have closure, associativity, a zero, minuses for everything, and commutativity. The minuses also allows us to do subtraction in, in, in a ring. Now with multiplication, we ask for much less. We only need closure and associativity. So if you have two elements, A and B, a times B should be in your set. That's actually what it means to say we have an operation on the set, a binary operation, and it should be associative. So A times B times C should be the same as A times B times C. And that's all we need. We also need distributive laws to connect the multiplication and the addition. And that means that A times B plus C should be A times B plus A times C as well as B plus C times A should be B times A plus C times A. Um, if it happens that um, we, our, our ring, our, uh, so, so that's what a ring is, but, but if our, it happens that our ring has also a one, a multiplicative identity, a, an element that when you multiply by other elements, um, nothing happens. So one times A is A and A times one is A. You don't have to have such an element, but if you do, then we say that we have a ring with identity. There are other names that people use for rings with identity, ring with unity, ring with one, um, unitary ring, uh, unital ring. Those are all names that people use for a ring with identity, a ring that has um, a, a one. If it happens to be that AB equals BA for all elements of the ring, then we say that the ring is a commutative ring. Um, for groups, when we, we have, if you have a group and under the operation, the operation was commutative, we called that an abelian group. We don't do that for rings. For rings, we call them a commutative ring. And this is basically because of the history of where they came from. Um, they, they, they came from different places. Commutative rings have, rings have their own vocabulary. They would not be so happy if you use the vocabulary of groups for them. Um, so a commutative ring is where the multiplication is um, uh, commutative. Now, the addition in a ring is always commutative. Um, so this is a definition of a ring. And, and, and what we're going to do in this lecture is just talk about some very basic properties. So um, basically, though, the way to think about rings is that it's a world where you have some elements and you can add them, you can subtract, that's because you have negatives, and you can multiply, but you can't necessarily divide. Um, uh, you don't have divi necessarily a division. So the first question that I want to uh, address is that, why am I asking, uh, if I'm trying to be very general, why is it that 
addition, I, I said, is commutative. So why not have that also be sometimes commutative, sometimes not, just like multiplication is sometimes commutative and sometimes not. And, and here's a proposition that tells us why that is. Let's assume that we have a set that satisfies all the axioms of a ring, except possibly the one that says that addition is commutative, meaning that we don't know if A plus B equals B plus A. That's the one thing we don't know. We know everything else, but we don't know that. Let's also assume that we have an identity, a multiplicative identity one. So, uh, so we have everything uh, that we had before. We have a multiplicative identity one, um, but we don't know if A plus B equals B plus A. This proposition tells us that then um, R is a ring, and in particular, addition is automatically commutative. So, so the purpose, the moral of the story here with this proposition is that as long as you are interested in a ring with identity, and most rings we like to work with are rings with identity, then, um, then you're forced to have addition be commutative. If you don't have addition commutative, then some of the other axioms also fall through the cracks. And what, what's the proof of this? The proof of this is that, okay, let's take two elements, A, B, and in R. R is not a ring, but does it satisfy all the other axioms. And I want to prove to you that A plus B got to be B plus A, no matter what, what, what you, you know, your wishes are. It just, just a matter, it's just a, the way things are. And to prove that, I'm going to tell you, calculate 1 plus A times 1 plus B. Okay, one way to calculate that is to think of 1 plus A as one thing, so 1 plus A times 1 plus B and use the associative laws. And, and that will give you 1 plus A times 1 plus 1 plus A times B. And then you use the, the, the other, um, uh, not associative, distributive law. Now you will use the other distributive law. And, and we get that when we multiply 1 plus A by 1, we get 1 plus A. When we multiply 1 plus A by B, we get uh, B plus AB. Now we do the same thing, one plus A times one plus E, this is one plus B, but we use the other distributive laws and think of one plus B as one element. And if we do it that way, we get one times one plus B plus A times one plus B. Okay, so what? And we can use the distributive laws again and multiply these out and we will get one plus B because one times, B and, and then plus A plus AB. But these two have to be the same because both of them are what one plus A times one plus B R. And if you put these equal to each other, then you can subtract because you're in an abelian, uh, you're in an, uh, not an abelian group, you're in a group. And, and whatever this one plus A plus B plus AB is, um, you, can, uh, you can add minus one uh, to the left and get rid of the ones, and you can add minus AB to the right and get rid of the, um, get rid of the ABs, and you're left with A plus B equals B plus A. Okay. Now, um, there are some very elementary properties of rings that, uh, uh, that I want to go over. So if you have a ring, um, so again, you have a set with two, operation, uh, two operations and you have these two elements, A, B, and, uh, a, B and R, then some of the things that you might just you know, remember from high school are true, except you never worked with rings unless you already have, but in which case you shouldn't be listening to this lecture. But, but, um, uh, but but we, this is a very abstract object. And for this abstract object, some familiar things that you, uh, you might think, okay, those are reasonable, but we're not a part of the um, axioms are still true. So what are they? So first of all, the zero element, that zero is unique. Secondly, minus A is unique. So every element A had a minus, minus it, that minus A, the, all the axiom said is that there is one, but we are saying that it's unique. Um, Zero was that element that when you added it to thing, nothing happened. Zero plus A was A. But that zero, if you then multiply it, uh, you will get zero always. Um, and if a ring has an identity, then the one is unique. If a ring is identity and um, the number of elements is greater or equal to two, then one and zero can't be the same. Now, there is a ring um, with identity that has only one element, and that's the ring that just have the element zero. And in that ring, Zero, zero, because it's just one element, that zero is zero, it's also one, and zero equals one. Except for that, in any kind of a ring with, if you have zero and one, they can't be the same. Um, minus A plus B is minus A plus minus B. Minus minus A is A. 
Um, minus AB is the same as minus A times B, the same as A times minus B. And AB is the same as minus A times minus B. Negative times negative is positive. But you might say, well, I know these things. No, you don't. Because these are in the context of a general abstract ring. Now, some of these conditions, the, the conditions that I have in red, the, the one, two, six, and seven condition, are only about addition. They, they have nothing to do with multiplication. We're saying that element zero, then when you add it to other things, um, gave you that thing back, that element is unique. There's only one of them. There can't be two elements like that. We are saying that for every element, the negative is, is unique. Um, then minus A plus B equals minus A plus uh, minus B and minus minus A equals A are also statements about ad ad addition. And because of that, these all follow from the fact that we, we assume that R plus is an abelian group. And if you remember your group theory, or if you don't, well, then you have to prove this. But, but I'm assuming that you've already looked at the videos for group theory and you um, know that in an abelian group, we have these, uh, these properties and therefore those carry over to rings. So the remaining ones are the ones that need proof for us because they're about multiplication and multiplication is not, we didn't say that it's a group. It, it's it's a, only have closure and associativity and we have the distributive laws. So we have to um, work with those. So let's now prove um, uh, items three, four, five, eight, and nine. So we'll do those one at a time. For the third one, we have to show that A times zero is zero. Remember, zero is the element that if you add it to other things, nothing happens. But here we're multiplying it. And, and our axioms did not tell us anything about what that happens. Now, you will agree with me that if there is any justice in the world, this will have to be true, but that's not a proof. So um, how would I uh, prove that A times zero is zero? Well, I say A times zero, I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, it's the same as A times zero plus zero. That's because zero plus zero is zero. And then I can use my distributive laws and say that this is A zero plus A zero. Now, if you look at it, I have A times zero here, A times zero plus A times zero. And I have, uh, I know that every element, whatever this A times zero is, there's a minus A times zero. And I can add that to both sides of this equation. And if I do that, I get A times zero is zero. So I'm done with that proof. But I have to show you that one is unique. One was the multi multiplicative identity. So let's say that it's not. Uh, well, I mean, let's say one and we are both ones. One and we both walk through the door and say, we are the ones. We are the one for this ring. And, and you want to settle that dispute. Is it one or is it V? And so what you do is that you say, well, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to multiply the two, you, you two guys together. One times V, what is that? Well, one says, well, one times V, of course, is going to be V because I'm the identity. I'm one. When I get multiplied by other things, I get that other thing. So one times V is going to be V. But V will say, wait a second, I'm the identity. So if I get multiplied by one, I'm going to give you one because when I multiply by something else, I give you that other thing. So one times V should be at the same time V at the same time one, as long as we believe the, um, the claims of both one and we to be one, uh, to be ones for this ring. And then that means that one is equal to V. So they weren't really different. They were the same thing. Okay, so one is unique because any two elements that claim to be one are actually the same element. Now, uh, the fifth condition was that if the ring has more than two elements, then one and zero are not the same. So let's assume they are the same and let's see what happens. Can one be equal to zero? If one was equal to zero, so what? What would go wrong? Nothing in particular would go wrong, but if you take any other element, any element in the ring, including one that one equals zero, but any element R, and, and uh, we now know from our, uh, the thing we proved earlier, that if you take that R and multiply it by zero, you get zero. But this zero, um, this zero here is also one. So it's also R times one, but we, we know that R times one is R, so R must be zero. So this says that every element of the ring must be the zero element. So that means that the ring has only one element, the zero element. So this is the only time that one is zero, when the ring has one element and it's the ring consisting of that zero element. A a any other time when the ring has two or more elements, um, then one will not be the same as zero. Um, condition eight, we have to show that if you take A and multiply it by minus B, you get minus AB. 
Well, this is a claim on, on, on the part of A times minus B. A times minus B is walking through the door and saying, I am minus AB. I mean, AB is sitting there minding its own business. A times minus B is saying, I am the, in, the, the additive inverse of AB. How do you check that? If someone said that I am the minus of that, that, that other guy and you don't believe it, you just add them. See if you get zero or not. Um, and if you do, then, then the, the claim was correct. If you don't, you say, sorry, that, 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 that doesn't fan out. So we take A time, times minus B, the claimant, and add it to AB, see if we get the zero or not. Well, we can just, just use the distributive laws and say that, well, we can factor that A out. That was one of our distributive laws. And minus B plus B is zero, and A times zero is zero. We got that um, when we add these two guys, we get zero. So A times minus B is negative of AB. And, and similarly, the other proof is the same. Um, minus A times B is the same as minus AB. Um, we also need to show that AB is minus A times minus B. And now we can show what we have in part eight, eight to show that. So this is the way we go about it. We say, well, let's find minus A times minus B. And, and first I'm gonna think of minus A as one thing and say, I've got minus A times minus B. Now, what did we prove in A? We proved that if you take anything times minus B, you can take that minus and bring it up front. So we can take this minus in front of the B and bring it up front. And so we have minus, minus A times B. But we also know that in, in the second thing we proved that if you have minus the product of two things, that minus can go inside um, I get multiplied first, we can find by, by that first thing. We take, take, take minus and bring it in. So this minus that we have, we can actually take it inside that first thing. And so we can write it as minus minus A. But minus minus A is A. And so we've got A, B, and we're done. So we've got done with these elementary properties. Um, now, let's. I, I just want to take a step back and think about this for a second. That in group theory, if you've done group theory, um, you know that if, if I say that I have a group of order seven, seven is a prime number, then that there's only one such group. Um, all groups of order se seven are isomorphic to um, integers mod seven with addition. Uh, the reason for that, if you don't remember or, or if you haven't done, well, not if you haven't done groups, because then the stuff I'm going to say won't, won't make much sense. But if you ha have done groups but don't remember that, is because that if you take a non-identity element in this group and look at the subgroup generated by that, then that subgroup uh, will have to have an order that divides the order of the group. That's by Lagrange's theorem. Because seven is a prime, the size of that, um, um, that subgroup got to be either one or seven. Can't be one because it already has an element that's not the identity element. So it has to be the whole group. So that means that every non-identity element generates the whole group. The whole group is cyclic. All cyclic groups of the same order are isomorphic. So, um, uh, and Z mod seven Z with addition is a cyclic group of order seven. So all groups of order seven are isomorphic to that one group. Now, if you have a ring with seven elements, then you know that with plus, um, you have an abelian group of order seven. In fact, you don't even have to know that you have an abelian group of order seven. You just needed to know that you have a group of order seven, and you would know automatically that the addition table for the ring is the same as the addition table for Z7, Z mod seven Z uh, with, with addition, my integers mod seven, module seven uh, with addition. But what about multiplication? This doesn't say that multiplication has to work like multiplication for integers mod seven also. In fact, um, we have more than one choice. Um, so so the, all rings with seven elements will have um, a, an addition table that's the same as each other. But for the multiplication table, you, will, you might have multiple choices. One choice, for example, would be to have the multiplication of the integers mod seven. But another one, for example, would be if all multiplication, everything multiplied by itself gave you zero. That would work. Um, um, I mean, it would be a dull ring, but, but it would, would be a ring. So, so one has more choices for rings uh, than for, uh, for groups. In, in a, more to the point, finite rings is really not where things are at. Um, rings are, we are much more interested in infinite rings than we are in finite rings, but we will get to that uh, later. 
Okay. Um, some more uh, things that we can we can think about uh, uh, rings. Um, so let's start with a ring with with identity. Now, if you have a ring with identity, you have a one, but that doesn't mean every element has an inverse. But some elements might have an inverse, including one has an inverse itself. One times one is one. An element is has an inverse if you have a friend for it that if you multiply, you get one. Such an element, uh, we so so let's say u is in R. And we call that a unit if it has a multiplicative inverse. Uh, so that means that there is some other element which we call u inverse, as opposed to minus u for the additive inverse, such that u times u inverse and u inverse times u both are equal to one. Some elements might be units, others might not be. For example, zero is never a unit because as long as the ring has more than one element, because zero times other things is zero. It's never going to be one. Um, now, if you take the elements that are units, we give that a name. We call that R times. I mean, we don't, don't say R times, but we call that the group of units of R. But we write R times, but uh, R times, but we call it the group of units of R. And so here's some a few, a couple of examples. If you take uh, integers mod six with addition and multiplication, then um, the units, the elements of this that have Multiplicative, multiplicative inverse are one and five. So that's a group where that, I mean, that's two elements. And in fact, it's a group. That's why it's called a group of units. I will prove that in the next slide. Um, so, uh, so the group of units is just one and five. If you take the complex numbers, that's an infinite uh, uh, ring with addition and multiplication, uh, then um, everything has, has, a, has a unit other than zero. So the group of units is all complex numbers other than zero. If you take the integers with the, the, the normal integers with the normal addition and multiplication, then the only things that have inverses are plus or minus one. Like if you take three, its inverse would like to be one third, but that's not an integer. The only integers whose, whose um, multiplicative inverses are also integers are plus or minus one. So uh, a proposition that I want to prove quickly is that if you have a ring with identity, then the group of units is actually a group, justifying calling it a group. Um, uh, the group of units is a group with multiplication. Um, and, and, and what do I need to do? Well, I need to prove it's closed, uh, as, uh, it's associative, it has an identity, and it has inverses. That's what it takes to prove that something is a group. Um, R has a one. I mean, we said that it has an identity, and that one is going to be um, um, uh, uh, it's going to be is is a unit, and so um, we have uh, identity. Um, it is associative because the original ring was associative, and and therefore that uh, the group of units inherits that elements of the group of units are still in the original ring. I mean. You know, we put them in the group of units, but they're still members of the original ring. And the original ring, when you multiply them, uh, we had associativity. Um, it's the same multiplication, so we still have associativity. So that hasn't changed any anywhere. Um, so what about inverses? So only invertible elements uh, are already in in a group of units. So 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 I, we only put the elements that are invertible. But the question is that is their inverse also? A, a, um, in the group of units? And the answer is yes, because the inverse of an invertible element is also invertible. Why? Because the original element was its inverse. If A is the, a is the inverse of B, B is the inverse of A. So both of them are invertible. So if an element is invertible and it's in R, t R, R times, then so is its inverse. And so, so we have inverses also. So the only thing that remains is closure. Uh, and so the question is that, if A and B are invertible and therefore in the group of units, is um, A, B also invertible? When I multiply them, do I get an inverse? And, and the answer is given to us by the socks and shoes theorem. If you put on your socks and then shoes, but then want to take them off, you first have to take off your shoes and then socks. A, B inverse is B inverse A inverse. Um, the, the proof of that is pretty straightforward. You take B inverse A inverse and multiply it by A, B in either side, and you get the identity. And so AB is invertible, and so we're done. So that, so that proves closure, and, and we have a group. Um, OK. So um, some more vocabulary. So at the beginning of ring theory, you have to have some vocabulary. 
if you have a positive integer and you are in a ring and you have an element of the ring, then zero, zero is a positive integer, zero sub z I wrote so that you know this is not the zero of the ring, but, but this is the zero integer. So I'm going to define what I mean if I take zero a's and I'm going to say that, well, that's going to be the zero of the ring. And I'm also going to define what I mean by 47a. 47 might not be element of the ring, but I'm still defining what 47a is. It's not multiplication. 47a is going to tell me that just add a 47 times. So, so this is a reasonable thing to do. And if, you are, if I said, well, what about minus, minus 47 times a? Well, I'll say do the 47a, but then take its negative. Um, so that's the definition of minus n times a. I'm going to also define exponentiation. a to the 1. This 1 is not the 1 of the ring. This is the integer 1. a to the 1 is going to mean a. And a to the n means a times a to the n minus 1, as long as n is positive. So a to the 47 means a times a to the 46. But then what's a to the 46? Well, that's a times for a to the 45. Well, a, what's a to the 45? That's a times a to the 44. And just keep going. And, and a to the n is really a times a times a times a n times. Um, and um, now, only if R has an identity, then I will define a raised to the power 0 to be 1. And this one is the one of the ring, not the number one. <laughs> um, so a is an element of the ring. But if you raise it to the number 0, you get one of the ring. Uh, maybe I should have written 1 sub r here to make that clear. Um, also, if a happens to be a unit and has a multiplicative inverse, a inverse, then I can define a to the minus n, n. And that will mean a inverse raised to the nth power. And we, we said how to find that. a inverse to the nth power means a inverse times a inverse times a inverse n times. So the point is that, and this can actually be confusing, um, in the, uh, that in a ring, we ha already have multiplication and addition, but we also have given meaning to what we mean by 35 a, where a is some element of the ring. It just means take a and we'll add it to itself 35 times. And we also have given a meaning to what a to the 35 means. Um, and also a to the minus 35, but that only makes sense if there is an a inverse. And a to the zero only makes sense if, a, if the ring has identity. Um, there could be confusion if, for example, 47 is an element of your ring, and, 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 and then you write 47n, and you're wondering, is 47 an n? Um, are you multiplying 47 and n in the ring, or are you saying 47 n's? Um, well, um, if there's justice in the world, then that for, the, the two things should mean the same. Um, but but you, it's possible to think of uh, things where that's not the case, and then you have to make things really clear. Do I mean 47 n in the sense of add, take n, add it to itself 47 times, or um, um, or uh, the element 47 multiplied by the element n? Again, in most usual uh, not made up context, those things will end up being the same. Okay, now these things that we defined also fo follow familiar rooms, rules. So if you have a ring, you have an element in the ring and you have two integers, integers can be positive, negative, or zero, then MA plus NA, NA will be M plus N times A. M times NA will be MN times A. So remember, MN is an integer. M and N are integers, you multiply them. And, and, and we're saying that uh, these two sides are the same. Um, a to the m times a to the n is a to the m plus n. a to the n inverse is the same as a to the minus n. And a to the m to the n is a to the mn. Again, you might say, oh, I know this from, from, um, uh, from something, uh, algebra one. And the answer is no, you don't. These are about a general ring. They're not just about numbers. They're not just about... Uh, um, the fact that these work with numbers, but they work in a general ring. How would you prove them? I'm not going to go through the proof. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. These you just have to write down what both sides of the equation mean, and you will get that they're the same. You just you might have to do cases. We might have to say, well, what, if they're positive integers, then this happens, and if they're negative integers, then that's what happens. But but um, all you do is just show that the two sides mean the same. Like for example, if you take the third one, a m times a n equals a times a to the m plus n. If m and n are positive, then the left side means take a multiplied by itself m times a, 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 and then a times itself n times a, 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 a. Well, then you have, have a times itself m plus n times. 
But if it's negative, M and N are negatives, then you have to um, go back to the definition and um, write, um, well, M is, uh, in, instead of A to the M, write minus A to the minus minus M, so that minus M is positive, and then do the same thing, and then and, and it'll all work out. Okay, now some more uh, categorization of rings. Um, um, the nicest kind of ring you could have is if um, with multiplication, you have a group also. Well, but you can't have that because zero will never have an inverse. In groups, you have to have um, every element have an inverse. So you, something is a field. If we throw away zero, then you have an abelian group. I mean, you, you, know, you could have a group and we'll get to that in a second. But, um, but, but, but if you have an abelian group when you throw away zero with multiplication, that's the best of our worlds. And that's called the field. So a field is a ring. That therefore you have addition, subtraction, and multiplication. But if you throw away zero, you also have, uh, um, you have a group, which means that you also have division. You can divide by every element other than zero in a field. So a field is where you can do all four arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, but by non-zero elements. Um, now, if you have a ring, we call it a division ring. If it's still pretty nice, but R, when you throw away zero, you still get a group, but not necessarily an abelian group. So a division ring and a field are very similar to each other. The only difference is that in a field, we are assuming that multiplication is commutative. Um, so if, if, if you have a field or a division ring, some of the things you do know, then first of all, you have to have an identity um, um, because otherwise you wouldn't be getting this group. Uh, that, that identity is gonna be the identity of your group. Um, that you're, you're, you have to have at least two elements because when you take it, throw away zero, you need to have a group. When you throw away zero, if you were left with an empty set, then you wouldn't have a group because a group can't have a, a, no elements. So as soon as you have a field or a division ring, you have at least two elements and therefore one and zero are different, for example. And if you look at the group of units, it's going to be everything other than zero. Um, so every element other than zero. Uh, is going to be the group of units. And in fact, you can think of that as almost a definition. Okay, um, so now uh, the ring of integers. So we still are in the, in, in the process of defining categories of rings uh, that we will want to study as we go forward. So the ring of integers is our prototypical example of a community ring with identity. And we are focusing on community rings with identity. And the integers are the one we like. We like that because uh, it's very helpful uh, in doing number theory. And, and, and as you, you might have seen in the previous lecture, uh, we would like to extend the integers to as bigger sets to be able to solve Diophantine equations, among other things. And, uh, and, and to do that, we need to be able to do number theory with things that behave like integers, but are bigger than integers. There's more elements in them than integers. Uh, so we want to really sort of understand um, uh, uh, this uh, ring of integers and, and see what other rings are um, like the integers. Rings like to be like integers. So, so if you are a ring, you say, I like to be like the integers. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and maybe you, you aspire, that's your aspiration. Maybe you can make it, most people can't, most rings can't, but, 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 but they, 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 the ring of integers has properties that we want to emulate in other things. Uh, and one of them, the one that we will do today, but in future lectures, there will be other ones that we will uh, look at, is the following fact. If you are in, a, in the ring of integers, and if you have x minus 4, x minus 7 equals 0, um, and if these are integers, then you immediately say that, um, uh, that x is 4 or x is 7. X and Y are integers. I should have had blackboard Z here, not just Z. Um, so you would include that. And how, why would you know that? Well, you would know that because when you have the product of two things equals zero, either this one or that one got to be zero. That's what happens with numbers. And uh, it's not because you are in a field. If you were in a field, you could, for example, maybe divide by X minus four. You would say if X minus four is not zero, let's divide by that and we would get X minus seven is zero. But if x minus four is an integer like five, you can't divide by five in the integers because one fifth, dividing by five is the same as multiplying by one fifth. One fifth is not an integer. But with still in integers, you might say, well, that's just, you know, you, yeah, you can do that. Um, and, and x is four or x is seven. 
that's the property that we really like. One of the properties of rings, in fact, uh, of the integers that we really, really like. So, so the thing we don't like is if this doesn't happen and that's where, where zero divisors come. So uh, zero divisors are things we don't really like. And, and so we are gonna define them. So if you have a ring and you have some non-zero element, I mean, zero has the right to when you multiply it by things to give you zero, but other things should not have that right. So A is a left zero divisor. We're not assuming we're in a commutative ring. If you we were in a commutative ring, uh, then we do, we, we do need to make a distinction between left and right zero divisors. A is a left zero divisor. If there's some other non-zero element such that when you find a product, you get zero. So this is a bad thing. You have two non-zero things multiplied and gave you zero. So that would be like, if, if we had such thing like that, then we couldn't say that one factor or the other must be zero because you have elements where they're neither one is zero, but you multiply and you get zero. That thing is called the left zero divisor. And a right zero divisor, if the other way around, if you, if you have something, um, uh, if A is on the right and B is on the left, then we say that A is a right zero divisor. Of course, if A is a right zero divisor, then B will be a left zero divisor and vice versa. And a zero divisor, if it's, if it's either one of them, left or, or right. And in a, in a commutative ring, it doesn't really make any difference you just talk about zero divisors. Um, either there is some other non-zero element that when you multiply it gives you zero or there's not no such thing. Now, as I said, we don't like zero divisors. So we're gonna give a name to rings that don't have zero divisors. One place that doesn't have zero divisors is the integers. And, um, um, and, and, and so this is one of those conditions that integers have that, that rings that aspire to be like integers would like to have. And, and some of them do, some of them succeed, some of them don't. So if you have a ring, we say that it's an integral domain if certain properties hold. First of all, it has to be a commutative ring with identity, uh, sort of like the integers. Um, it has to also have more than two elements. Well, this is my definition and, and quite a few people agree with me and this, they put that. Um, quite a few authors don't though and, and um, have the ring with just zero also called an integral domain. If you do that, then you will have to in your theorems often say um, a non-trivial integral domain because you don't want that one. So I don't want to keep saying that. So I'm, I'm just excluding that, that uh, boring ring from uh, the, the world of integral domains. Um, although then I have to sometimes say that rings have more than uh, at least two elements. Um, so, uh, but, but, but the important thing is that it shouldn't have any zero divisors. And I'm just gonna say zero divisors, not left or right because it's a commutative ring. So the two concepts are equivalent. So a ring that is an integral domain, if it's commutative ring identity with at least two elements and um, has no zero divisors. So in an integral domain, if you have a product equals zero, because you don't have any zero divisors, you know that one or the other must be zero. And so you can solve equations like the one we had on top in integral domains. So our, again, prototypical example of an integral domain is the integers. In the next video, we will talk about quite a few examples of rings and, 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 and in particular integral domains as well. Now, um, the first thing that I wanna prove is that fields are integral domains. So a field is an integral domain. That's what we wanna prove. Um, so uh, what do I have to prove? I have to prove to you that I mean, a field will have at least two elements. It is a commutative ring with identity. So the only thing that I have to prove is that it doesn't have any zero divisors. Now, if A times B is zero and, and A is not zero, then um, could, what would happen? Well, well, then I could say B is A inverse times AB. I can say that with it because in a, in a field, every non-zero uh, element has an inverse and A inverse times AB is equal to, um, this is not, yeah, no, AB is zero. So this is correct. Um, A inverse times AB is A inverse times zero because AB is zero and, and then A inverse times zero will be zero. So B will be zero. So if you have AB equals zero and A is not zero, then B gotta be zero. So you don't have any, um, um, any zero divisors. So, so far um, we can organize some of the things we know. I, I actually, I don't have community rings with identity here in a hierarchy of rings that we have. So fields are the top dog. Um, if you're a field, you're all of these things. Sort of the more specific thing are is fields. We're asking a lot from fields. They give us a lot too. 
but fields are, are, are sort of the more specific things. Um, fields are division rings. It's just that fields are commutative in multiplication, division rings are not. Fields are integral domains. That's we just, what we just proved. Integral domains and division rings have identity. Integral domains are commutative um, and uh, all of these things are rings. Okay. Um, in integral domains though, we want to talk about the following cancellation a little bit. So if, if you're in a ring and you've got AB equals AC, then can I cancel A? Well, you can if A is a unit, because if A is a unit, meaning that it has an inverse, then you can say that A inverse times AB is the same as A inverse times AC. And, and what does that mean? When you multiply that out, you get that B equals C. Um, now, uh, we, now, but, but if, what if we don't have inverses? And so in many rings, we don't have inverses for elements and A is not a unit. So, so we are gonna define what we mean by cancellation laws. If you have a ring, we say that R has, it, has left cancellation. If uh, whenever A, B equals A, C and A is not zero, you can cancel that A and get B equals C, right? Cancellation is defined similarly. Now in a commutative ring, if you have left cancellation, of course you will have right cancellation as well. Now, the thing that I, we wanna prove that if you have a commutative ring with identity with at least two elements, again, it's not the, the, the trivial ring zero, then R is an integral domain if and only if it has cancellation. So, uh, so cancellation is actually what makes integral domains integral domains. And so in integral domains, even though we might not have inverses for all elements, we have cancellation. That's the nice thing about in integral domains. Even though like in, in the argument at the top, we use inverses to show that you can cancel, but in integral domains, we might not have, a, um, we might not have um, inverses. Like for example, in the integers, the only elements that have inverses are plus or minus one, yet we can cancel. Um, and and so, so, so why is that? Well, first of, I mean, first of all, this is an if and only if, and so we have to prove two directions. So one direction, assume cancellation, let's prove that R is an integral domain. And what, because we have everything else, it's a commutative ring with unity and, um, and, and the number of elements is at least two. All we have to do is to show that there are no zero divisors. So let's say that AB is zero and A is not zero. Um, uh, if B can be non-zero, non then we're in trouble. So if AB is zero and A is not zero, then what we do is that we say, well, we, what we have is that AB is zero, but we can write zero as A times zero. And then because we have cancellation, we can cancel those A's and we get B is zero. So this means that we don't have any zero divisors. And so we have an integral domain. Now, for the other direction, assume that you have an integral domain, we have to show cancellation. This is the interesting one. Why is it that we can cancel even though we don't have inverses? And so if you have A, B equals A, C, and A is not zero, you can't cancel zero. You can't cancel zero in our world. You can't cancel zero anywhere. But if A, B equals A, C, and A is not zero, why can I cancel A? And the reason is that um, you can uh, write this as AB minus AC equals zero. You're in the ring, so you can subtract. And then you have distributive laws and you can factor A and you can write that A times B minus C is zero. Um, so what? Ah, but we're in an integral domain and integral domains don't have zero divisors. A was not zero. So then that means that B minus C uh, must be zero. But if B minus C is zero, then B equals C. And we just get cancellation. Um, and one uh, consequence of that is that if you are in a finite integral domain, then you've got a field. Well, a finite integral domain with at least two elements. I should have added that um, uh, because, uh, ah, no, not, not in my case, because uh, in my case, uh, a finite integral domain, the, 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 um, uh, the, the integral domain with just one element, I mean, I don't have an integral domain with just one element. The ring with just one element is not an integral domain, so I'm good. I thought this was a typo, but it's not. Okay, so, um, uh, so what do I have to show? First, I have to show that, uh, to, to show that we have a field, you have to show that D minus uh, zero, when you throw a zero, you have an abelian group. The abelian part is okay because we are a commutative ring with identity. Um, but first, we, what, what about closure? Well, closure, you might say that multiplication is closed, but you have to say one little thing. This, this is D minus zero. So if you take two elements that are non-zero and multiply them, why is the answer non-zero? Oh, because we are in an integral domain and we don't have any zero divisors. So we have closure because an integral domain 
um, is uh, it does not have any zero divisors. Associativity is inherited from the, from from the integral domain. Just the fact that you throw away zero doesn't mean anything. You still have a you are associative. You still have one. Uh, the integral domain had one that has an inverse. It's in um, and 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 that one, the one that when you multiply it by other things, nothing happens. It's in d minus zero, and and so d minus zero multiplication is has closure associativity, and it has one. What is it missing? We have to show inverses, and that's not so obvious. I mean, if you're in an integral domain, why would you have inverses? And and that doesn't work in general. In general, you don't have inverses, but in the case of finite integral domains, you do have inverses. So uh, this might be an argument that might be familiar to you from, uh, from group theory. So let's pick an element in D and, and let's say it's non-zero because we want it to be in D minus zero. And then let's show that it has an inverse. So how do I do that? I, I'm going to look at powers of R, R, R squared, R, R cubed, R, so on forever. But this is an infinite list, but D is finite. So there must be repeats in this list. So let's say that r to the i is r to the j, and one or the other of those has to be bigger than the other one. So let's say i is less than j. Well, then that means that r times r times r times i times 1, the identity, is the same as r times r times r times r j times. Um, and because um, uh, we are an integral domain, we have cancellation. Even though we don't have inverses, we have cancellation. We can, on the left, cancel r's. And you can repeatedly cancel R's until you run out on one side. Well, I is less than J, so you're going to run out on the left before you run out on the right. And what you will get is that of R to the J minus I, that's what you get on the right, is equal to 1, which is what's left on the left. Maybe I should have written 1 equals R to the J minus I. So what? Well, then that means that if you let S be R to the J minus I minus 1, 1 less R, then S star R or R times S, both are one. And then that means that S is R inverse. And every element, R was an arbitrary element, has an inverse. We proved that finite integral domains are fields. There's actually another theorem that says that every finite division ring is also a field. This sort of sounds like uh, the previous one, but it's not because this is telling you that if you have a finite division ring, what was the difference between division ring and the field? The only difference was that a field is commutative. So it's saying that if you have a finite division ring and you don't have commutativity, then you do have commutativity. <laughs> um, um, and, and this is not a trivial theorem. The other theorem was not that hard to prove. Um, and in fact, in one slide, I could do it. This one you can't do in. Um, in, in one side. It, there's different kinds of proofs of it, but they all uh, involve uh, some my more heavy duty machinery. Um, there, a proof using cyclotomic polynomials, which you don't know what it is, is, is done much later in the Galois theory chapters of my book. Um, and uh, um, maybe you will go look at it. Okay, so I'm done with this lecture. This was uh, uh, there are three elementary lectures on ring theory. The previous lecture was about, the, the video was about why to study rings at all, about the Ifantine equations and, and, and how, how solving them leads to you to want to study rings like rings of integers and ask questions about them. This one was uh, the one in blue, rings, integral domains, and fields definitions and basic properties. The next one is going to be examples of rings and fields. In this lecture, I didn't give you many examples. In the next one, it will only be examples. Till next time.